Good morning, Covenant Word. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How you all doing today? Doing good. Hey, Elijah. Good to be here with you this morning. And uh, uh, we are uh, continuing our series, continuing to feed the flock. Welcome you out there uh, uh, who are watching by YouTube, watching the uh, website. Uh, we welcome you. Uh, and uh, we also uh, want to let you know that if you're looking for a church home, if you're fed by this uh, website uh, and you need a place to uh, deliver your tithes, tithes and offerings we do accept and they are tax deductible uh, through this ministry. And uh, I do welcome your comments, your replies, your questions. Uh, and you can you can find us on covenantwordwcc.wordpress.com, uh, and that'll show up on your screen so that you can you can log in and share that with your friends, neighbors, uh, unsaved uh, friends that you might have as well. Uh, we want to bring them into the body of Christ, uh, and we encourage you to find a church home where they're teaching the word uh, and the congregation operates in love that's an atmosphere where you can grow in godliness but where they're teaching the word is where it's at that's where you need to be it needs to be christ-centered the delivered in love and biblically sound that church home amen amen uh, uh, if you have your bibles with you uh, you can open up with me to first corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 and as you turn to first corinthians chapter 2 1 through 5 we have a quotation for the day from thomas fuller and uh, the quote, let us stop the progress of sin in our soul at the first stage. For the farther it goes, the faster it will increase. <laughs> Amen. 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 Anytime you feed your flesh, your flesh demands to be fed. You know, that's the way of looking at that. So, so starve your flesh by feeding your spirit. And your spirit eats or feeds on the word of God. You feed the word of God to your spirit, it will starve your flesh. Amen. Excellent quotation of the day. Thank you, Brother Marcel, for that quotation. And now, to our message. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, which was also our morning devotion. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to be teaching from the New King James Version. And it reads as follows. And I, brethren... When I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech, or of the wisdom of de or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the message that you've prepared in my heart for this flock, your people. Thank you for those who are listening out there on uh, the internet right now. I pray that this word would go out and reach them and touch them where they are. I thank you for renewing our minds to your word. I thank you for confirming your word with appropriate signs and wonders to follow by way of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for ministering to us, speak to us today through your word. And we thank you for not just challenging us, but thank you for the transformation effect that your word has on us. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And those in agreement with that prayer said amen. 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 Uh, today we're dealing with the fourth safeguard, and that is the uh, surrendering to the centrality of the cross. Surrender to the centrality of the cross. That's the fourth safeguard that we're dealing with. We've dealt with three so far. We've dealt with humility. Uh, that's a safeguard against deception. We've dealt with receiving a love of the truth. Uh, that safeguards us against the strong delusion that God will send for those, uh, to those who did not receive a love of the truth. We are receiving a love of the truth. And number three, uh, cultivating the fear of the Lord is essential in safeguarding us against deception, cultivating a fear of the Lord. And today, uh, we will be dealing with the fourth safeguard, which is surrender to the centrality of the cross. Surrendering to the centrality of the cross. All right, let's get 
into it right away. Uh, uh, this passage that we're taking uh, uh, from Corinthians, uh, this speaks to Paul's day. And uh, Paul is revealing some things from this passage that I believe uh, we will, will gather some necessary information that will help us in evangelism as well as growing in godliness. Uh, but primarily we're, we're dealing with this safeguard as a safeguard to deception. Uh, everyone is susceptible to deception. We've already established that fact that Jesus said in the last days that, that if it weren't for the shortening of those days that even the elect would be deceived. So that, that implies that the elect is capable or the elect is capable of being deceived. It's possible for you as the elect to be deceived if you're not careful. Amen? Amen. If you're not careful. We have to be careful. We have to allow for the word of God to give us the information that we need uh, to safeguard against deception. I'm glad that God laid it out for us in the word so that we can keep from being deceived. Aren't you glad of that? Uh, in Paul's day, you were looked upon with high esteem for your oratory skills. And those who weren't as skilled or as talented uh, were despised and even made fun of. They were ridiculed. They were rioted uh, for their lack of inability to speak or lack of uh, oratory skills. Uh, you also are dealing with the fact that, that in Paul's day, you know, Greek philosophy uh, was at its peak. Uh, in those days, it was it was philosophy that was looked upon as as uh, the status. You know, what I mean, the status symbol. If you were able to philosophize or or, or to, to be strong in philosophy, you were you were part of the elite. You could say, you know, uh, that was during the time that universities were created. It was by the Greeks or through the Greeks that we have universities today. You know, so, so you're dealing with a group of intellectuals. And I'm glad that you have that backdrop to look at, uh, uh, to look at what Paul was presenting to us uh, over against because God uh, is totally not like that. Uh, when you talk about fighting the good fight of faith, you're talking about a different plane of existence, you know, fighting the good fight of faith. When you fight the good fight of faith, the good fight, of course, we've already established, a good fight is a fight where you win. You win. And so God is, is laying out for us through the Apostle Paul how to win in life by fighting the good fight of faith. The fight of faith takes place in the spirit realm. And uh, the intellectual realm is in the soulish realm. You see that? So Paul is, is actually contrasting uh, the gospel message over against the soulish uh, climate of the time you know, where intellect was exalted. You see that intellect was placed above anything spiritual. Of course, uh, you didn't really have anything spiritual until the gospel showed up to uh, show it up, if you would. You know, I mean, to show up intellectual knowledge. And we're going to take a journey today uh, that will leave us with three PowerPoints that I want to give you. Three PowerPoints that you can take home and work out for yourselves. Like I said, I want to give you a working knowledge of the scripture, something that you can improve on. Uh, but I'm going to introduce this not as a, someone who masters it, but someone who has to practice this themselves. I have to practice this also. But uh, 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 what was Paul's approach here in this passage over against that backdrop? Well, to start with, uh, uh, Paul's approach was to show that he relied on Christ only. And not only that, but he relied on his atoning work on the cross. Paul was actually highlighting his weaknesses. He was highlighting his own inabilities. That was his approach in this passage, if you want to want to see that. But compare that over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's turn there if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 9. Actually, verse 9 is where we'll focus our spiritual spotlight. But I'm going to start up with verse 5 to kind of lead into it. Verse 5 says, For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself, that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I'm sorry. 
That sounded good, didn't it? Wrong passage. Flip over. I'm looking at verse 12. I thought that was sounding kind of strange. Uh, but uh, uh, let me back up. Where are we at? Uh, verse 9 is where we want to deal with. I'm going to back up to <coughs> verse 7. It says, Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now notice this, that Paul didn't say here that God gave him this thorn in the flesh, as some have implied. You know, God gave, gives us a thorn in the flesh so that we'll be humble. Well, it says that a thorn was given in the flesh uh, to Paul, and he even told us what the thorn was. He said that it was a messenger of Satan. Everybody say messenger. 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 The Greek word for messenger is anglios. If you look in the Greek, he says that it was an anglios of Satan. So you could say that it was an angel of Satan, which is another word for messenger or synonym for messenger. It was an angel of Satan dispatched to do harm to Paul. That's what he says in uh, uh, verse 7. A thorn was given in the flesh to him, a messenger, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Uh, in the King James Version, it says thrice. Basically, it, it was a Hebrew idiom. It didn't say three times, or I, I won't say I, figuratively. He was asking over and over again for God to deliver him from this messenger of Satan. All right, the Hebrew idiom over and over again, thrice, three times. Uh, the, the, the point is, over and over again, he was asking God to deliver. All right, it was a prayer of deliverance, uh, is what he was asking for. But verse 9 is what I want us to focus our spotlight on. It says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for it, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So now there's a revelation right there. God gives him the revelation. That his strength is made perfect in weakness. Also make note of this fact. That God did not reject his plea to take away the messenger. Alright. God didn't say no I'm not going to do it. When he pleaded with him to take this messenger away. But instead rather God gives him a revelation. He says my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. One more note to make of here. That God says to Paul in his answer uh, 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 that his strength is made perfect in weakness. See, some have implied that Paul's weakness or infirmity was sickness. Was sickness. Uh, uh, by definition, infirmity means sickness, but it also means weakness. What determines which it is is the context. In this context, Paul is saying that it's a weakness and not a sickness. And God confirms it in his answer with the revelation that my strength is made perfect in weakness. If it was sickness, he would have said that my health is made perfect in your sickness. You see that? But rather, he says my strength is made perfect in weakness. So what does Paul do with the revelation? Next sentence, verse 9, he says, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, or boast in my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, now he discovers the principle of how to uh, draw from God's strength, the power of God. It's going to be by uh, uh, embracing his weakness. You see that? I'm going to embrace my shortcomings. I'm going to embrace my limitations, basically is what he's saying, so that the power of God will rest on it. You see? See how that works? That's where, by the way, we get uh, 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 from Isaiah 40, verse 31. You don't have to turn there, but... But uh, it's one of those commonly quoted scriptures. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. Now notice the progression. It starts from the higher to the lower. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. You see that? They'll mount up with wings as eagles. As a, that would take place in the spirit realm. And what happens in the spirit realm, very much like the eagle, when he mounts up on the winds, you know what I mean? You can look up and see an eagle soaring for hours, and he never flaps his wings. Why is that? Because he's riding not on his own power, but on the power of the wind. You see that? Well, ironically enough, you know, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Pneuma. Everybody say pneuma. 
Numa. Numa means wind or breath. You see that? Or spirit. So, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. They'll mount up with wings as eagles because they'll be riding on an invisible power that's not their own. It'll be the wind. You see that? The wind. Now, that's the analogy. If you wait on the Lord, you'll mount up with wings as eagles on the wind of the spirit. You see that? Now, you'll be able to operate and not exert your own energy and you'll, you'll, you won't be tired. <laughs> you see that? You'll, you'll be relying on the Lord's strength or relying on the Lord's power by doing it. So that's what Isaiah 40 alludes to. Write this down. Here's your first of three PowerPoints in light of that. See, God must bring us to the place where our strength fails so that we learn to rely on the strength he provides. You see that? God has to bring us to the place where our strength fails so that we learn to rely on the strength that he provides. I don't think it's a coincidence that in the Beatitudes, when he, when he lays out for us uh, the prototype of a kingdom person, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In another translation, it says, blessed are they who are spiritually bankrupt, for, the, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God's resources kicks in. <coughs> Excuse me. You see, uh, uh, that's a divine principle. When you realize that your own resources are, are bankrupt, when you realize that you've used up your own resources, isn't it funny how you notice how God's resources kicks in? Sometimes you find yourself praying like this, you know, like, like you know, I, Lord, I don't, I don't have nothing else to, to rely on. Everything else has failed. All I got is you. And then something comes through after that. Now, why is that? You know, it's because you finally come to the end of yourself and the beginning of God's strength, or the beginning of God's power, or the beginning of God's provision, whatever it is that you need from God, you have to exhaust your own first to come to the beginning of His. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. See, those are the ones who've learned how to tap into the kingdom of God's resources. Does that make sense? Amen? Amen. <laughs> well, what happens if we don't allow... That process to take place. What happens? Well, here's what happens. Uh, we again will learn or lean on our own perceived sufficiency. And then we'll fall into the snare of self-righteousness. Everybody say self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. Self -righteousness. Remember, we've looked at before that self-righteousness, our own righteousness, is as filthy rags to God. Uh, make note of this. Uh, uh, Job had that experience. Uh, it wasn't just his fear that opened the door to his dilemma. Uh, Job 3.25 says that the thing that I feared most finally came upon me. Well, we know that the thing that he feared brought the stuff on him because fear is faith in reverse. But Job chapter 29 shows us another open door as to why these things happened to him. Job was self-righteous. Did you know that? Job 29 talks about how righteous Job was, and he's talking about himself. That since I'm so righteous, these things shouldn't be happening to me. But when you fall on your own or, or rely on your own self-righteousness, when you rely on your own righteousness, you are an open prey to the devil. Fair game to him. You see that? You're fair game to the devil. So uh, uh, if we don't go through the process of allowing God to bring us to that place where our own sufficiency fails, you know, and, it's, and it's better to bring yourself to that place, you know, but sometimes we have to learn how to get there through brokenness. You know I mean, it's, it's a hard way to go, but it's necessary to be used of God. Uh, but once you get there, it's, 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 it's easy to go back there. It's easy to, easier to revisit that place. You know what I mean? Once we learn that, you'll see what I mean. But uh, 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 we'll, we, we safeguard against self-righteousness uh, when we, when we uh, 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 how could you say, when we learn how to rely on God's strength. We're going to learn that even, even further on. But note this too, that it wasn't fear. Uh, like I said, Job's dilemma happened because of his self-righteousness. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 again. I want you to look at verses 4 and 5. Chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Listen to what Paul says here. He says, And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, 
but in the power of God. So here's your second power point to write down. You ready? Focus on the cross, focusing on the cross, is essential to release the power of the Holy Spirit. Focusing on the cross is essential in order to release the power of the Holy Spirit. See, how does the Holy Spirit come in in the first place? See, the Holy Spirit comes in through the Word. See, He, he confirms the Word that's preached. Primarily, he, he confirms the Gospel message when it's preached. See, that's the transforming power of the Gospel message. The power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 1.16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them who believe. To the Jew first and to the Greek. You see that? We got the Word of God from the Jew. So the word of God is to the Jew first. See, they were the only ones who had an appreciation for the word of God in their day. Uh, uh, and now, through the word of God, we've come in, the Gentiles. Uh, 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 the Apostle Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Now we've come in, and we have the word of God. The same word that, that the Holy Spirit confirmed through them confirms the same word through us whenever we preach the word. Because it's not the messenger that he confirms. It's the message. See that? The message. And the initial message is the gospel message. That's the message that transforms us when we come in. And the Holy Spirit works in conjunction with that gospel message. Amen? Amen. Well, so focusing on the cross is essential uh, to release the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at Romans chapter 15. Uh, I want to confirm that with a few verses of Scripture. Romans chapter 15 Verses 18, Romans 15, verses 18 and 19. Romans 18, let me flip on over a few more pages. Here we go. Romans 15, verses 18 and 19. It says, For I will not dare speak, dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. In mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Elycrium, or Elycium, I can't say that word, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Let me read that one more time. It says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me, in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient, in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem, and round about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel. Skip down to verse 29. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. When he's talking about the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ, that means that the gospel uh, uh, brings with it the fullness that every human being needs. You see that? Uh, uh, the gospel, the finished work of Christ preached in the gospel. Uh, brings about the human need, uh, 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 the answer to every need that humans have. You see what I mean? It's a completed work. It sounds too simple or oversimplified, but God is interested in bringing you in, not keeping you out. You see that? So he makes it simple by way of the gospel message. The gospel message makes it uh, 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 something simple. Uh, look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, look at starting with verse 8. Verse 8. This is another passage that shows how the gospel message is confirmed by the power of the Spirit. It says in verse 8, And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now everybody say, look at this, back up for a minute, he says he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily, reasoning daily. How often was he reasoning? He was reasoning daily, right? Reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus, verse 10. And this continued for two years. So he was reasoning daily for two years. Wow. Reasoning daily for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greek. So he was reasoning daily for two years the word of the Lord Jesus. All right? What can possibly happen 
if you do that. Verse 11, it says, yeah. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Huh. See, we've read that as if Paul was some superhuman apostle uh, that God worked through. But see, Paul was a vessel just like us. Uh, there's a law of cause and effect at work here. See, the cause of, of Paul's unusual miracles is found in verses 8 through 10. He was reasoning daily for two years straight, the word of God, persuading people uh, to follow Jesus. And because of that, being saturated in the word of God, it produced miracles. See, that's how the Holy Spirit confirms the word of God, through signs and wonders to follow. The more words you get, the more the Holy Spirit has something to work with. You see that? You preach the word, that makes the Holy Spirit's job easy. See what the Holy Spirit doesn't work apart from the Word. Now, who is the Word? The Word is Jesus Himself. So the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. You can say that He glorifies the Word uh, when we preach the message, uh, and that is Him glorifying Jesus by confirming the Word uh, with the appropriate signs and wonders that I always pray for, the appropriate signs and wonders. Uh, now, make note of this. When Paul, uh, back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when Paul excused himself, for his weak uh, oratory skills, he also excused himself of his limited wisdom. Did you notice that? He excused himself of his limited wisdom. Now what did he mean by limited wisdom? What did he mean by that? Here's what he meant. He meant specifically a lack of familiarity of Greek philosophy. Didn't I mention earlier that this was an age of intellectual uh, wisdom, an age uh, where they exalted the intellectual, the philosopher. Uh, since they looked up to the philosopher, here comes Paul, and he's not much of a philosopher by comparison to the great philosophers that they know of in their schools. So he excused himself of his lack of limited wisdom uh, in that uh, uh, regard. Uh, look at what I mean by here. I'm going to explain this to you. In Acts chapter 17, uh, uh, Acts chapter 17, in Acts chapter 17, you see where Paul shows up in Athens. And uh, uh, I'm not going to go into the specific scriptures on that, but if you read for yourself the book of uh, the chapter uh, itself, chapter 17, you're going to find Paul in Athens where the uh, uh, Greek philosophers are. And uh, uh, it was a university city where he was in, uh, in Athens, an intellectual center is where it was. Now what happened there was Paul adapting to his audience <coughs> and in keeping with scripture, because it says, I've become all things to all people so that some might be saved. Here's where Paul was doing that. Yeah, uh, he was becoming one of the philosophers here in Athens. And uh, not only did he adapt to his audience by becoming a perceived philosopher, but he even quoted from one of their Greek philosophers. You know, one of their own poets. And uh, uh, he, he did that uh, to, to, to kind of get their attention. Well, what was the result? Well, the result was nominal. See, Paul preached an intellectual sermon. And like I said, he quoted from one of their own philosophers. And only a few believers followed his message. Only a few believers came and responded to his message. So it was a nominal uh, response. Didn't do much. All right. He tried an intellectual sermon, and it didn't work. So what happened next? Acts chapter 18. You don't have to turn there either. But in Acts chapter 18, uh, that's where he went to Corinth, which is the letter that we're listening to right now. He went to Corinth, and that was a major sin-ridden port city, uh, very much like Las Vegas. What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, 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 it was noted that... that some of the prince, uh, 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 the, the, the temple prostitutes of the city, how they would lure young sailors in when they would come into the port. Uh, the sailor would already be attracted to the beauty of the, the prostitute. And when, they would, when, they would, when she would have them follow her, she had on the bottom of her shoes, follow me. So it would leave that imprint in the sand. So you'd see the, the footprints in follow me. And you would follow those footprints on up to the temple where they would be worshiping to their demon gods and the worship that they would be 
be uh, uh, enjoying would actually be an orgy. You see that? Uh, of course, you, you can't go home and report that to your wife or husband. <laughs> you were down there worshiping Corinth. You know, what religion were you, you know, involved in? You know? So what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth, a major port city. Uh, so Paul gets to test the gospel message over against a sin-ridden city. You see that? And uh, he learned a lesson from Acts chapter 17, and he takes it over into Acts chapter 18. And make note of this, that it was between Athens and Corinth that Paul decided to abandon human skill and wisdom in order to rely on the strength of God. So what did he do? He made Christ crucified or the cross the center of his message. That's what he did. He took that with him to Corinth. And the result was he established the church. Now you have these letters written to the church of Corinth for our benefit because of the message of the cross. So let's read it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Since Paul learned that lesson, let's see how it worked out for him. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, didn't come with excellence of speech or in the wisdom, uh, 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 or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, because I did that back there in Athens, Acts chapter 17. For I determined on purpose not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's doing that over against the sin of Corinth. Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Some, some have mentioned that the weakness that he might have been in was due to the stoning and beatings that he, he endured. So, of course, his appearance would probably be weak. You see that? But remember, God's strength is made perfect in weakness. He says, in my speech... And my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Because I'm going to give you the message that the Holy Spirit works with. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So here's your final and third power point. Surrendering personal claims to power or ability allows the Holy Spirit to come in power and speak through our weakness. Surrendering personal claims to power or ability allows the Holy Spirit to come in power and speak through our weakness. That's exactly what Paul did. He surrendered all his personal claims to power and ability and he centered his focus on the cross. That allowed the Holy Spirit to come in power and to speak through his weakness. That their faith would rest in the power of God and not in the wisdom of men. Amen. That will safeguard us against deception. That will safeguard us from uh, the latter day deception and apostasy uh, uh, that will and has already and is taking place today. But it says that many won't uh, 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 they won't endure sound doctrine in the last days. But they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. But we know how to stay focused on the cross. And that's where the power of God comes in. So I want to pray with you right where you are that you would receive Jesus Christ. He died for you. And not only did he die, but he rose for your justification. That was his love expressed to all of us. Uh, that we couldn't do something for ourselves. He did it for us. In that he took our sin and the punishment of our sin so that we could receive his righteousness. So I pray for you that you would receive Jesus Christ today as your Lord and Savior. And that you would find a church home that would teach you and, and mentor you and, and disciple you in the gospel. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you uh, as a sinner. You can repeat this prayer. I come to you as a sinner needing a Savior. And I thank you for dying on the cross and receiving my sin in your own body, that I would receive the righteousness of God in you, that I would be made righteous. And I thank you for taking my curse and the punishment that I deserve, that I would receive uh, uh, an inheritance in you, that I would receive heaven. Thank you for connecting me to the Father. And thank you for filling me with your Holy Spirit. And we give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. And if you made that prayer your prayer, then find a church home that's teaching the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Word of God a church home that can love on you. And we would love to, to uh, pastor you also here at Covenant Word Christian Center. Um, and uh, uh, feel free to comment on the website. 
And I look forward to hearing from you. Amen. 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 That's good. Amen. That's good.